All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Sorry, just doing some last minute and stuff there. Stephanie was co-host. Perfect. Okay. So good. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining me. So tonight I will be talking about my social entrepreneurship project, which is called H2 Ottawa. Um, I used the framework that we provided to you in the syllabus to give you examples of what each stage means and how they can be carried out. Also, I'm going to tell the full story of H2 Ottawa. So if uh, you do decide to take your project past the bounds of these course, it, those stages might help you out. Um, and then, of course, like just a little disclaimer here, H2 Ottawa was my master's thesis. Okay, so this is not what we're expecting you guys to do. It took me about three years to implement this project at the University of Ottawa campus. And I earned about 400 hours in volunteer service for my work on it from the Office of Campus Sustainability. So again, like we are absolutely not expecting this from you for your end of term. I just, I just designed the lecture in this way to get rid of some confusion that you might have about the stages and what they mean. And then in the clinic after, if you guys have a question about one of the specific stages that I'm talking about in my lecture tonight, um, just you can you know use a tangible example or that I present tonight to kind of like guide those questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep, thank you, Dave. All right, so here we go. So I called this lecture the H2 Ottawa story because it's just that, it's a story. It all started with me. I started my academic journey at the University of Toronto, which is my hometown, where I got my honors BA in the sociology of sex and gender and sexual diversity studies. When I finished my degree, I was offered to work with one of my professors and do a master's in the criminalization of HIV, but it didn't really call to me. It wasn't, it didn't appeal to me in the way I wasn't excited about it. So I was pretty unsure of what to do. I took I decided to take a year off, which a lot of people tend to do. And I served at restaurants all over Toronto and met all kinds of people, one of whom convinced me to move to Ottawa. Being at a kind of transitory period in my own life, I figured, hey, what the heck? And here I am. I continued to serve at Lansdowne Park, which was super, super fun. And it allowed me to get to know the city a little bit more and it's awesome, awesome people. But I really felt like something was missing. Day in and day out, I put on my server pouch, but I really felt like I was living the same day over and over and over again. You get the picture. So I enrolled myself in night school and I studied 12th grade calculus because I decided that I would do my master's in business. I passed my tests because honestly I had someone doing them for me. But when the final exam came, I knew that I was gonna fail the course. So I was feeling super defeated. I was in the same spot that I was in back, in, back home in Toronto. But then it dawned on me, right? Like, hey, Dummy, why are you trying to get into a field where you have to compete with people who actually know how to do calculus, right? Like I would be struggling through it and I wouldn't be great. So why not go into something that you're great at? And I decided to do what I'm great at. And for me, that's sociology. So sociology in a couple sentences, for those of you who don't know, it's the study of the development structure and functioning of human society, as well as the study of social problems. I still remember feeling a surge of energy when I made this great discovery that was re really just hidden in plain sight. So I had to look within myself and I had to place myself where I felt that I belonged. With this in mind, I went to the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Ottawa and I knocked on Dr. Nathan Young's office door. I chatted with him a bit and he seemed really cool. So I said, okay, I guess environmental sociology is where I'm gonna be for the next two years of my life. So this is important because I had no background in it. I went in completely blind, okay? So when I started my master's degree, the first class that I had to take was a qualitative methodologies course. It was my first day on campus and I personally miscalculated how long I was gonna take to walk there. So I was already super late for class. Not a great look, right? So I finally got to campus and it seems so silly to me now, but I couldn't find the Faculty of Social Sciences. I finally ran over and I'm literally like, I'm dripping with sweat at this point. 
And I'm waiting for the FSS elevator. For those of you who are in the Faculty of Social Sciences, you know that it takes forever. And I'm looking for my water bottle while I'm waiting for this elevator. And it turned out that I'd forgotten it. So at this point, I'm just so defeated. I'm so frustrated with myself. So this big life-changing move that I'm making and taking this degree and I'm already proving to myself that I can't do it. So I figured that I wasn't gonna go to class and hop out every half hour to sip at the water fountain. I went to the cafe on campus in FSS instead and I went to go buy a bottle of water. And that, my friends, is how H2 Ottawa started. The University of Ottawa banned the sale of bottled water in 2010. I started my master's in 2015. So this was five years later. I came to learn that U Ottawa was one of the first institutions in Ontario to make this call. But why, like why ban bottled water? At that moment, when I furiously grabbed a bottle of vitamin water from the cafe, I genuinely had no idea. I was just angry and I was frustrated. And it was because of the things that were going on in my own life. When I finally walked into class, the professor was talking about our end of term project. So like I said, it was a qualitative methodologies, or I don't know if I said that, but it was a qualitative methodologies course. It was a compulsory course for the master's program. And it turned out that our end of term project was to conduct an interview and write a report on it. I figured that I would find the people who banned bottled water and get it back. If I felt like this, other students had to feel like this too. But in preparation for my interview, I started doing my research. I needed some fuel for the fiery interview with our very own Jonathan Maceo that I had initially envisioned. But in doing my research, I found that the reasons why the university banned bottled water made a lot of sense. The university realized that it was about $2 per liter, liter of bottle of water, or $2 for a thousand liters of water that came from the fountains that the university was already providing to its community on campus. Then there was the fact that, you know, bottled water, when it's being transported from the site to places like the University of Ottawa, it sits there. It gets stale. If it's not held in the right conditions, if there's too much heat, like um, most water bottles are made out of the plastic that we call PET. And what basically happens is if there's too much heat that hits that PET, it leaches chemicals into the water. So that's not super great. Versus the city of Ottawa that tests their water every five seconds seems like a pretty obvious um, conclusion. So finally, the university pointed out that single use plastics were a huge cause of our waste problem as well. And they said, you know what, there are too many, there are too many ills to providing bottled water on campus, we're going to ban it. So did banning water benefit the University of Ottawa? I looked into the benefits that U Ottawa had incurred from the ban. And one of the big ones was that the university established a standard for accessible and well-maintained water fountains on campus. But students were actually buying less single-use bottles, right? The waste diversion strategies that the, that the ban of bottled water promised the university was happening, right? Or, like me, did they just pick up the next best thing, like the vitamin water that I mentioned? Turned out, that the ones I asked were getting the next best thing. If students did not have their water bottles, they tended to go, um, they weren't going to the campus store to spend $50 on a U Ottawa branded swell bottle. Universities are similar to a micro society of the greater society, right? This. And we have the same kinds of trends when it comes to social behavior, as at least when it came to my project. So I looked at the 2017, this is, I'm dating myself a bit, but this is uh, when H2 water will kind of happen. So I looked at the 2017 RBC Can Canadian water attitude study and I found a gap. So here on the slide, if you look at the left column, that tells us why Canadians do drink less bottled water. And the top reasons are environmental protections and to save money. So you auto has been, they achieved those things, right? Check and check. But if we look over at the right side, where it tells us why Canadians drink more bottled water. It's for reasons of convenience and portability. So how do, we keep, how do we keep this side? How do we keep the good stuff, but make it better? And that's how my interview with Jonathan Raseo ended that day. How do we do better? I'll give you a little teaser here. You take the research you did. So for me, it was finding that people hated bottled water because of the environmental harms and because they thought it was too expensive. 
and then you add a product that fills the problem. So increasing the portability of water and the convenience of access. So once we built this idea, and at this point, like I said, that was a teaser. It was still just an idea. The product hadn't been bought or launched or anything yet. It was still only at the very beginning of my story. So Jonathan and I, you can see the two of us on the right there, decided that we would find a reusable, recyclable, and cheap bottle that could be used to increase the portability of water and the convenience to accessing portable water on campus. So let's take a step back for a second. The whole while I'm still in my master's thesis, how the heck was I gonna manage launching this project that I was so passionate about with John, but while also completing the loads, and I do mean loads of work heaped on my plate for the degree. So what did I do? I combined them. I told my supervisor, who's Professor Nathan Young, like I, I said on the right side of the screen, about my struggle, and we found theories and methodologies that would enable me to complete my degree and do it well. So we said, I'll use an ecological modernity approach. Ecological modernity is a sociological concept that argues that the, that the economy actually benefits from moving towards environmentalism. It's the idea that we can tinker on the fringes of big problems, making small teeny incremental changes so that when all of these small changes are combined, they together make a big impact. Then I used a participatory action research methodology, which allowed me to use my own personal experiences with building the project, building the brand and the launch as a scholarly method. And then I created a question that was relevant to the academic field. And my question was, how does the University of Ottawa accept or deny sustainability initiatives? I conducted interviews with each of the people who I asked for support and funding to answer my question. A lot of it was that it depends on the balance between cost and payback. So the faculties generally said that it was a pretty cheap project. I wasn't asking them for very much money for them to support. And the payback was what they got the branding, which is usually very expensive, right? Like if we're talking about digital marketing, getting your name out there, like that kind of stuff costs a lot of money. They also loved that it was student driven. And that's, that's very relevant to you guys here. There were two faculties who did not end up participating in the funding of the project. And that was the faculty of science and the faculty of medicine. We didn't ask medicine to participate because the pilot project launch was based on the structures and services at U Ottawa central campus. So they actually wouldn't have fit to be part of the project. Then the faculty of science did not have vending machines in their buildings. So there was no way that we could logistically implement selling the bottles to their students. But then medicine shared their disappointment that they were not asked to participate. And science did marketing and media promotions for us. So they did support me, but just in other ways. Considering that this was a marketing project for the faculties, my point of contacts were the people who work in communications for each faculty. So that's why I contacted to give me funding. So with all of these moving parts, we made H2 Ottawa an academically inspired project. Now let's build H2 Ottawa. So John and I, we made a plan. We knew that the metal bottle was the answer for us, but what about our partners? I mean, I needed someone to pay for this, right? So we asked ourselves, how do we impact the gap? We got that, got the bottle, got the idea, but in a way that convinces our partners that my solution, this solution is the best possible solution to their problem. So we had to frame it. The University of Ottawa, at the end of the day, it's a business with its main interests being student experience and student retention. There is no University of Ottawa without University of Ottawa students. So as a student, I said, hey, this is going on and it shouldn't be. Let's work together and let's fix it. But what's in it for them, right? How do we make this project look sexy? So along with my points about accessibility for students on campus, I tied in hot global and lo local global communal societal topics like saving the turtles as, that, as my, uh, my Snapchat there for H2 Ottawa states. That was a hot topic item at the time. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch was also a hot topic at the time. So I argued that if students are still buying single use bottles on campus, we're basically killing turtles and putting garbage in the Great Canadian or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I built more frames that would convince the university that this had to be done. It was a big issue environmentally, but it was also a big issue economically, socially, culturally, and communally. And we had to fix it. We had to impact change. So the university saw this and they saw a marketing opportunity. 
And that's when I expanded my group. I needed funding. And I'll tell you right now, John and Nathan were not going to pay for it. John's probably laughing right now if he's here at the concept. So I lobbied all of you Ottawa faculties and services. I started with the faculties. So I decided that I would print their logos on all of the bottles and feature them in vending machines in their building. I argued that, hey, this is an affordable item to promote your faculty. The alternatives for them are like sweaters at the, and hats and, and pencils and stuff that they sell at the campus store. So their support says that they care about student projects and the university and sustainability, but it also gives them this branding power. So they bought it. It's like, no, seriously, like I said, all of them bought it. Since every faculty supported my project, the former president of the university, Alan Rock, who's here on the slide, um, got his central team on it as well. So when the office of the president found out, the Defy the Conventional campaign promised me that they would help me push it out to media. So at this point, of course, it was just shaking hands and promises. I had to show them the money. So I wrote out of the context, I wrote out the context of U Ottawa. I wrote out my solution that they all already knew, but now I gave them a tangible plan for implementation. So here we can see cost benefit analysis. You have the bottles with labels and all of the costs are laid out. You have the cost model, all the costs are laid out. And this is just taken from my thesis. So if you guys wanna see the bigger ones, you can download that online. Um, and then, yeah, so with showing them these charts, I also gave them options. So like I said, they're not all here. So if one of the things that I, I noted to them was, you know, if you don't want it printed, if you don't want to pay the extra cost to actually have these bottles ran through this like silk screening machine to print your logos on them, then I'll buy you stickers that are half the cost. What about now? Will you support me now? Then we got to the ideate prototype and validation stage. So I gave, them um, I gave them images of what these bottles would look like to get their uh, feedback on design ideas. So as you can see, like there, it's like, do you want it horizontal or do you want it vertical? How do you want your, your bottles printed? Is it okay that we uh, brand that Makerspace also helped us out with this project? Is it okay if I use the branding for H2 Ottawa on this project? How do you feel about where all of that kind of stuff is positioned? Should I make it a hashtag so we could start mobilizing this idea online? So, they could see when I showed them these things and I gave them these options that I showed them that their money was being well spent, that I knew how I was going to implement the project. It was clear that I really, really, really thought this through. And in that they started transferring us money. I got the support that I needed by convincing them that this had a chance of making real, real impact. So this was a very long journey, like I noted, and it really wasn't without its problems. I remember I had a meeting with food services and I cried in bathroom stalls after one of them. There were countless sleepless nights, honestly, especially when I had to find a product that we could use to actually implement this project. So at this time, these cheap, no frills, kind of blank bo water bottles didn't exist. And I really do mean I searched everywhere. Like I'm talking about a, a solid month or two. I called breweries in Ottawa. I called coffee shops. Heck, I even contacted those, like, you know, when you go and do it yourself wine to see if their suppliers had aluminum bottles that were different shapes that we could fit into our own vending machines on New Ottawa campus. I tirelessly searched Alibaba Express, Alibaba, Amazon, Etsy. Honestly, I looked everywhere. And then something fantastic happened. It was months, like I said, until my computer's cookies system learned what I was looking for and it lent its helping hand. So it took me to a beauty products website. That bottle that you see on your screen is an aerosol makeup canister. I called the company, <laughs> it still cracks me up. I called the company and I asked if there were other caps that we could switch out instead of the traditional like aerosol that would make it function as a water bottle. And they did have it. So we got all of the documentation behind what the bottle was made from and it turned out that it was safe for carrying cold to room temperature water. The only problem that remained in that area was that the bottles were made in China and distributed through the States. So that, of course, it's a sustainability concern because you have to transfer, transport them to the University of Ottawa campus. But we figured with the quantities that we were buying and the waste that we would imaginably be diverting through implementing this project, that we should still run it. Then we started having branding issues. So we teamed up with Makerspace. So they're a group within the Faculty of Engineering that, um, that makes stuff. 
I can explain it right now, um, by rerouting some of our funding that the, that the faculties and services have given us to buy them a printer so that they could brand our bottles. But as you can see on the right hand of the screen there with the Office of Campus Sustainability bottle, it was etched in the first time that we did it. They used a laser printer. So um, that was like after several filters, I finally got some sort of image, but you really couldn't see it. The printer did not work, okay? And so we scrambled because we're getting close to that time where we had to launch the project at, at this point. So we finally found a printer that was still within our budget and we got them to silk screen the bottles. In other words, for those of you who don't know, it's like painting the bottles, which you can kind of see on that unmarked uh, or unwrapped bottle on the right hand side. So we were safe. And when the Defy the Conventional team agreed to promote H2 Ottawa, they designed and printed paper wraps for the bottles. So that's the rest of the blue bottles that you see over there that had the actual story behind the project so that people didn't have to always ask. If they were getting a, a bottle from vending machines, they would be able to read my story right then and there. Great idea, right? What could possibly go wrong? We even made sure that all of the faculty branded bottles underneath the wrapper, you have the faculty branding, right? So we've even made sure that all the faculty branded bottles went into the boxes for the respective faculty. Then we gave them the company that services our vending machines and they put them in the machines. We are ready for launch date, right? Wrong. When they actually did launch, all of the faculty, the people who were putting the bottles in the vending machines didn't understand what the markings on the boxes meant. It wasn't communicated to them properly. So we had faculty of education and faculty of social science. We had faculty of social science and faculty of law. We had faculty of law and you get the picture. It took me months to sort that out. But anyway, we had the showcase. We had finally finished the bottle and I was ecstatic to see three years of work in my hands something that I poured my absolute heart and soul into had finally come to fruition. I think John, I think you even gave me one for free, a prize everyone for 400 hours of volunteer service. Thank you, John. But remember, this was a master's project. So my other showcase was my thesis. I followed the rules of the game. And at the end of the day, I got my degree. The launch. On World Water Day of March 22, 2018, I set myself up in front of the living wall and I sold the bottles. I chatted with students and faculty and staff about the project. Life was good. I had done it, right? I did it. It was a huge sense of relief and a huge sense of pride for me. All of the media support from the faculties raised buzz in the UOttawa community and people were literally telling me that they specifically came to FSS to see me and talk to me about H2 Ottawa. It was like the most humbling experience I've ever had in my whole life. Prior to the launch, the university featured me on the front page of their website. And then they, I was interviewed by CBC. So now H2 Ottawa was mobilizing outside of the Ottawa community and I wanted to do more with it. So my next logical step was to engage grassroots communities. I'm sorry, community engagement but at the grassroots level. So that's my dad at the far left over there. He does jujitsu. So I figured, hey, people who do sports need water, right? So I got my dad to flip someone over his back while holding bottles, like, eh, promote it to sporty people. I figured that, you know, sustainability people like dogs. So I hit a treat under a bottle and I got uh, my friend's puppy to sniff at it. I sat at the, on the board, still do, but I sat on the board for the Environmental Studies Association of Canada then as well. So I convinced them to support me by giving my bottle away for free at, to members at our conference. And then I still worked as a server, server at local at the time. So I got my boss to sell it at local's um, table at the Great Leap garage sale. And then I got some feedback on it. I was like, guys, like, you know, I wanna do something with this project, what do you think? And they told me the ugly truth. It's the bottle guys, the bottle, it was ugly. So I listened and it turned out that a bartender who I worked with was a graphic designer. This is why networking is so important. So I teamed up with him to freshen its look. So finally, when the bottle was pretty and people knew about it, I brought it to Bluesfest. Bluesfest had a problem with single use water bottles too. They had water station, oh, well, now you can see the whole bottle. Thank goodness. So, um, Bluesfest had a problem with single use water bottles too. They had water stations. If any of you guys have been to Bluesfest, you, you probably would have seen them or city folk, but they have these big stations that are just filled with jugs of water. And then they have these little fountains, these little gooseneck 
uh, stems where you can go in and you can fill your reusable bottles. The problem is that some people forgot their bottles too. It's the same problem that we had at Ottawa U, but at Blues Fest. And uh, so people liked the idea. And the pictures that I have posted up there are of Three Days Grace, who performed there in 2018. And they brought my bottles on stage and took photos with them to help me promote it because they thought that the idea was great. So I'm gonna end my talk here with that same sentiment. It all starts with you guys. Dig deep, find who you are and find what you're great at. And then just be great at it. Allow yourself to be great at it. Take, take the opportunity, you know, take the opportunity of this class. If you're really passionate about your project, take it forward, move beyond the boundaries. You have, you have me, you have John, you have Steph, you have Mark. We all have worked in the university for a long time. Use our expertise, you know, pick our brains about this kind of stuff and, and let it influence what you can do. Because what seems like a stupid idea or a small impact or a bad day can turn into something fantastic. Um, but then just to kind of give you a note on what H2 Ottawa is now, it is currently no longer in circulation. Um, the Office of Campus Sustainability has contacted me to do some events like here and there, but my journey with H2 Ottawa came to a close when I embarked on my next journey, which was my PhD. So thanks for listening. I'll take questions for the next 10 minutes if anyone has any, and um, then we'll get into our clinic. Oh, come on guys, there's gotta be one question. I poured my heart and soul, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dave, yeah, go ahead. I do have a question actually. Um, is there a reason that you kind of just, like from what I understand, just like kind of ended it there? Why didn't you like keep it running or like try to spread it to other schools or like just grow it more? Is there a reason or? Yeah, there are a few actually. So one of the big ones was Trump was elected into office um, the following year, I think it was, and he imposed an aluminum tariff on Canada. So the bottle, the price of the bottles, which, you know, we kept them at $3 because we wanted them to be competitive with the other bottles that were in the vending machines. So the highest cost item was three bucks. We figured that that would be still convincing enough to students to, to opt for this multi-use bottle. Um, so that was one big one. The second one was my supervisor at the time had offered me an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. And uh, that was to work with him on the west coast of Vancouver Island on salmon fisheries. Um, he literally was like, hey, you like water, right? Do you want to like come and do this? <laughs> it's like, all right, here we go. Uh, and that is, that's put me on quite the journey. So uh, I'm, I'm a very busy, very busy woman right now. And uh, I just, I just don't have the time, unfortunately. But I have been, um, I have been contacted by other universities. I've been contacted by other like small gyms and stuff and where I can lend my expertise to, if they wanted to do their own H2 Ottawa project, I, uh, I have interviews with them and, and I do, I do that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no um, so clearly there's a lot of, uh, a lot of troubles and struggles through that whole story. Um, I'm curious as to what you thought was the hardest struggle. And I'm also curious as to what sort of, um, well, actually, no, that's basically just a question. Yeah. What do you think was the hardest part? Yeah. Thanks, Nash. That's a great question. Uh, if I think that the hardest part, it was honestly, The most emotional point of it for me was when I went to food services and I had that interview with Marine, uh, Marianne Moffat. And we had distributed the bottles in first year frosh kits, or not frosh kits. They had like special meal plans for first year students who are like um, bouncing between classes and don't have time to go to the meal hall for lunch or the dining hall for lunch. So she put them in there and that was our first run of like seeing, how stu seeing student engagement. And they hated it like hated it they were they were saying that you know she, did, she put out a survey for me and I was expecting you know sunshine and rainbows and they were like this is dumb we don't understand the point of it why can't we do anything else what like give us idea I'm sorry it was just the metal bottles they weren't branded yet okay. so um, yeah and that was a big part of the project too because I integrated that feedback I should have included that but I integrated that feedback into into my bottles and that's when we got that rap that told the story and then the engagement was so much higher because people understood like why we were doing this it wasn't just a product it was uh it was a story right like that was very much the point it was to make success um to make sustainability accessible to people so they didn't have to choose other options sweet thank you yeah uh Lauren go ahead 
Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. That was that was super interesting. Um, no, knowing what you know now, I was wondering um, how would you uh, how would you do things differently, and um, if you were to sort of start uh, start fresh now, knowing everything that you know uh, now, um, how fast do you think you could sort of launch things, and um, it sort of how, how do you imagine it would go differently? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Lauren. I haven't thought about that in a really long time. Um, I would have definitely, oh my gosh, the vending machine thing, like that was a nightmare. Like it took me months, honestly, to like rebrand stuff and then get students like what they had paid for and to pull all of the, the items out of the vending machine, put them back in the right ones. It was just, that was awful. So I would definitely have rethought that out logistically as to like, you know, figuring out those patterns or those, um, those communications. With, with the company that services those vending machines. Um, the other thing that I would have done is I would have looked into more options as to how we can create them in Canada. I mean, the price, it was really, really high and I didn't have enough time then because it was just, it was my master's thesis. I just wanted to get it done, but I would definitely look into suppliers here and, and see um, if we can make it more sustainable by, by doing it locally because the rest of it was an in-house project, which I was super proud of. Um, and then the one thing that I think that I wouldn't have done differently is going to faculties, like getting the support of faculties in communications and, and launching it as a marketing project for them. It worked really, really well with our partners. Um, and th that's also why the, the vending machine problem was such a big blow. Um, and I just, uh, and yeah, oh, and then the last thing, the paint on some of the bottles, if you like rubbed it hard enough, it would actually come off. So I would look into getting a printer that could, uh, that would like more effectively stick the paint onto the bottles. Does that answer your question? Okay, I think, I think it answers this question. Um, John, go right ahead. Yeah, sorry, there are a lot of people in the chat are wondering if they can still get a bottle. So putting you on the spot, do you think you could commit to giving the winning team a bottle? Absolutely. I'd be happy okay. to. Just one. They can fight over it. <laughs> John, you're probably still asking me for that three bucks back from the Yes, one I, I want that three bucks. Just <laughs> thank you, John. And yes, absolutely. Um, winning teams will get a bottle each. I'm generous like that. Uh, Augustine, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks. Hopefully uh, my audio is all right, I had some connection issues. So you might have answered this already or in your presentation. Okay. When they were in the, the vending machines, were they already filled with water or they were empty? No, they were empty. And if so, where did you source the water? And what was, oh, they were empty? Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we sold thanks. them empty. That actually, um, thanks for reminding me, that posed another problem. In the vending machines, because there's a certain weight that uh, is like 750 mil or whatever, 350 mil, I can't remember what the what it is, but there's a weight for the liquid that fills those bottles, right? So each of the vending machine slots, they actually like count that weight as like something is there. So sometimes they thought that the bottles were sold out. So they weren't dispensing them properly. That was a problem. Um, oh, but um, yeah, but to answer your question, the reason why we didn't fill them with water was because another big like hot topic at the time was water as a human right. So company, companies like Nestle were going into water, uh, going into small communities. They were like pulling, they're getting these massive tankers and they were like pulling all of this potable water out of like lakes and streams and reserves in small communities. Um, and then they were selling ba it back to them for like a thousand times the price. So that was a huge concern back then. Uh, and like the way that it, it manifested itself in like when people started doing activism and stuff about it was like if you're actually containing water it doesn't matter where it comes from like if you contain water in a bottle you're effectively reselling the water you're not selling the bottle anymore so that's the reason why we we didn't fill them but and then the other part of it was we were trying to promote University of Ottawa's uh, water fountains because the sustainability department decide or the sustainability office um, said that they were going to monitor the way that the water uh, fountains flowed and and keep like a report of everything and test it like I think it was monthly um, so it, it like the one of the purpose of the project was also to push students to use the fountains on campus so it's kind of like a three-pronged answer to that one awesome thank you yeah no problem Dave go ahead uh, yeah, I was kind of wondering actually, because when you did like the like the the survey you showed for like the 
why people were choosing to, to buy bottled water or not. Like I, there was a lot of other reasons, like obviously the main one was for like convenience and stuff. There's a lot of like other reasons. I don't like remember all of them exactly, but was, were those things you addressed as well or did you just focus on the big one? Yeah, like we glanced at it, but we were like, if the, because if you, I can send you the chart if you want, but if you look at the two pipe, like the two graphs, the biggest ones were at the very top. And then after that, like they got like pretty minuscule, like it was, it was like 22, 22, like 10, nine or whatever. So I was like, you know what, it doesn't seem to be a big enough concern for me to, for me to address those ones as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, Janessa, and this is a, uh, I'll take one more question if someone has after this, and then we'll get into explaining the project to, for next class to you guys, and we'll get into our groups. Go ahead, Janessa. Um, I just was wondering about, like, just because I was thinking for me, if I were to buy this from a thing, I would be concerned about it being clean, or like, if I would want to be using it right without cleaning it, did you find other people had a bit of resistance with that? Or is that an issue at all? Um, I, I didn't find that so much. We, we put like labels on the bottles that said, please rinse before use, because we got them basically like in the packaging from the, from the company. So um, the, like I said, we, there were some uh, questions about what the materials of the bottle were because BPE lining, BPA, sorry, lining was a big issue too. Um, but we found like through the reports that they didn't use any of those materials. So they deemed it food safe as long as you're keeping it room temperature to cold water in there. So we, we put like little um, like stickers on the bottom of the bottles that gave people that information and then asked them to rinse it before their use. People seem pretty okay with that. I was just curious. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay, so I'm going to grab a sip of water. I'll turn it over to Steph. She's going to discuss um, the next phase of your project that you guys are going to be working on. And then like promised, we'll have the full time for clinics tonight.